Hello, welcome. You are listening or perhaps watching Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. As uh, our normal host, Jeremy says, calls me his oft co-host. Uh, today, I'm the host. Uh, I've taken over Jeremy's spot. And I am joined by good friend and past guests of the show, Nick Tabor and Greg Williams. Nick, how are you doing today? Fantastic, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. Greg, how about yourself? Uh, living the dream, my friend. Awesome. So <clears throat> we here are, are going to discuss uh, opening a new school. But before we get to the discussion, I want to make sure that all of you guys out there listening and watching uh, know that this episode has its own website, uh, has its own page on whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. In fact, every episode we do has its own page. They, there you can find the show notes for the episode. You can find the transcripts. You can find kind of a, a, a little breakdown of what the episode is, is about and kind of some of the stuff we get into. Uh, sometimes there's more pictures. And uh, you can find... Uh, an interview with Nick Tabor. Nick, do you remember your episode number? 807. 806. <laughs> <laughs> you got to splice in the prices so failure sound right there. <laughs> like... <laughs> uh, Greg, how about yourself? Do you remember yours? I do not remember. 856. 856. 856. You guys were 50 apart. Um, so, you you know, you can go to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, check out their episodes, listen to their interviews. Uh, you can also go to Whistlekick.com to find out all of the things that we do. We don't just produce this podcast. We produce equipment. We produce sparring gear. We produce books. We produce training programs. You can see all of the events that we run and we host. There's so much stuff on Whistlekick.com. Uh, and if you use the code PODCAST15, you can actually save yourself 15% on just about anything in the store. Um, what else? What am I missing? You can also join our Patreon, uh, P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash Whistlekick, uh, and help support the show. Um, for as little as $2 a month, you'll actually get free stuff, uh, which is pretty cool. You get to know who the upcoming guests are and... All kinds of stuff, and it goes up from there. So, all right, guys, we are here to have some discussions on opening a new school. So all three of us, as of this recording, are in the process or have just barely started our own school. And I thought this would be a great topic for us to chat about, kind of how we got there, what made us decide to do that, what we have, any hurdles we've run into getting where we want to go and what the future kind of might look for us. So um, Nick, why don't we start with you? What first, what made you decide? What was the first impetus for, you know what? I'm going to do this. Well, I mean, the first impetus for starting a martial arts school, I mean, in the recent time or in just starting in general. Sure. All right. So like in general, I mean, it was something let's, I always let's go do. with the recent. Oh, recent. Okay. All right. So, uh, recently, I mean, it was, I, I was doing work as a personal trainer in, uh, in gyms and a lot of people were asking me, you know, like, you know, can you oh, teach a little bit of defense? Uh oh. Oh, shoot. All right. I'm back. All right. I'll start that part again. So the start of it yep. was, you know, well, I've been working in a gym as a personal trainer for a while and, the owner asked me, like, well, can you teach a little self-defense class? And a lot of clientele were asking, you know, you've been really passionate in talking about your past as a martial artist. Can you teach some classes? And then it, it snowballed from there, you know, where like, OK, like, what's your uniform look like? Can I get one like this? And then, you know, dusting off the old system and the old katas because um, i've been teaching for a while and i had put it aside because it was a little more lucrative just to do a side business as personal training but then it's like okay this became a little more lucrative because people were asking for it and uh, it just kind of snowballed and came up from there gotcha and greg how about yourself <clears throat> well you i've been teaching karate for years now um i've been wanting to have my own dojo 
but uh, just, you know, the opportunity never really uh, presented itself, uh, mostly just because of where I lived and, and, and where my kids were in age. Um, so uh, opening it now, um, my, my daughter just went off to college and you know that starting to get that empty nest going on and uh now's the time uh because i've moved to an area which has much less saturation uh where i was living before there was close to 30 martial arts schools in a five mile radius uh so not really yes yes uh, that that's how many um and just one more would just be one more in a sea of them. Uh, but where I'm living now, uh, there's a, you know, a smaller amount, so I can feel like I can have a, a presence and be able to have my own voice. And, uh, and now seems like the time. Yeah, okay, interesting. Uh, and you had not had a school in the, uh, an actual school in the past, but you've been teaching a long time. So yeah, I, I've never owned my own school. Um, from the time I was 18 or 19 to the time I was 24, I was the head instructor of a martial arts school. Someone else owned it. I was there, you know, I was their Riker to their Picard and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, it was a, it was a school with 300 students. Uh, so it was a very large school, um, had to do all the, you know, the, the program management had to, you know, curriculum, all that. Uh, but that's, uh, that, that was, uh, you know been a long time since since I've done uh, a school that that large in in the meantime I've been teaching at like camps and at my instructor school uh, mm -hmm. on a weekly basis uh, whether that be weapons or, or karate uh, what have you um, but yeah it's uh, it's now time for me to uh, you know open the gates and and see where it goes awesome and Nick had you had your own school like an actual dojo and I, I know from your interview which people should go and listen to, but you did a lot of private teaching. I did. Where yeah. you go around to your students' houses and teach, but had you in the past had a, this is a brick and mortar location where students come to you? Oh, that, yeah, that I never had. You know, I never had hmm. just because space in this area in Fall River, Massachusetts. Um, a lot of places did not want to rent to a martial arts studio. Um, there's a lot of studios here now that are either, it's like what I have now is a, a room inside of a gym that I can use that they're willing to go ahead and rent to me um, and mm -hmm. do that. But um, brick and mortar, it's just, it's just not, um, they're like, oh, otherwise, they're like, I'll get into it a little bit, but uh, insurance and costs were way too high, you know, right, right yeah, off. Yeah. The, and yeah. Yeah, and, that, and Nick, I didn't mean uh, your. I actually your... have a question for Nick. Nick, why wouldn't they uh, 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 want to rent to a martial arts academy? Was it uh, was it sound? Because you're loud, but, you know, or was it sound uh, was one thing? About... And like, yeah. um, I'll, I'll give you an example of a friend of mine who had it. Um, there was a space that he wanted to put in the town of Tiverton, Rhode Island, and it's in between an insurance office and a convenience store. So number one, what the problem was, was that, you know, there was just the traffic that would come in and, you know, specifically would be a lot of permanent people in there instead of push, you know, kind of touch and go in the parking lots and then, you know, repair costs and things. I mean, like, well, what if they break a wall? Well, well we, we're not going to break down the wall. Trust me. You know, we're not going to do that. And there was a lot of, um, a lot of things like what are you going to do when liability? What if something happens? And there are some laws in this area that make the landlords liable, and um, and then it just also um, give it it uh, it skyrockets That's the cost the on the insurance area yeah. on the insurance. So like, because you know, a lot of schools that have opened in the past have done things, and that's caused a lot of problems. Um, and we're paying for that now. You know, so we got to get really creative. Yeah. Yeah. So apologies yeah. for uh, talking over you there, Andrew. I, I didn't mean to. No, no, no. That's over. fine. It, yeah. Totally fine. Um, yeah. For me, so I had been training at a school locally here in Keene, New Hampshire, and uh, I wasn't. I had become increasingly unhappy with my own progression, my own training. And I have been a teacher my whole life. Um, Longtime listeners of the show will know that in my personal life, I teach, I teach music. And I have always been a teacher. Um, 
and I would often teach at the school that I was training at. Uh, but I really felt like there were some uh, missteps that my instructor had taken in the progression of, of, of the school uh, to help the students out. And, and so I had left and there is a, and we'll get into, we'll, the next thing we'll talk about is location, but basically someone in town said, I would really like a karate program uh, at my location. Can, is this something you could do? Uh, and so I said, you know what? I would, I would love to, I love teaching. I love martial arts. I love teaching martial arts. It will help me grow. Um, and because I thought about it for a long time, one of the reasons I'm becoming a teacher is to make myself better. Um, Absolutely. In so right. many ways, we all know that teaching will make you a better martial artist. Um, exactly. And so that's one of my reasons for doing so. So um, I'll talk about my location story next, and then then I'll pass it pass it to you, Greg. Next, but for me, uh, there is a martial arts school here in town that teaches Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And they have a separate class that teaches boxing. They have a separate class that teaches Muay Thai. They have a separate class that teaches Judo. They have a separate class that teaches Taekwondo. And they don't have a traditional karate program. And the owner of the business came to me and said, you know, I would love to have a traditional karate program. How can we make this work? Uh, and, you know, he came to me a few months ago and they only have one there's only one training space and all of the time slots from the afternoon to the evening are already filled with the martial arts that are already being taught, but he is expanding. He's getting more low, a larger training area. And so once the expansion happens, he'll have three separate training spaces. So BJJ can be happening in this space. Judo could be happening in this space and karate could be happening in this third space. So there's going to be a lot more time slots. And so I said, yeah, I would love to teach a traditional karate program, but we have to wait until the expansion happens. And so that was the plan. Now, the plan has morphed a little bit, but I'll talk about that after. But that's how I found my location uh, for where I was going to teach. Fortunately, he wants the program to be there. And so he's willing to give me some primetime spots uh, and we're still working out what the financial arrangement is going to be, but I'm not going to have to pay rent. It's either going to be a, a split of the, the money coming in or it's going to be I'm actually an employee of his. He still owns the school but I'm going to be teaching the traditional karate program and I will be a paid employee to teach those classes. So it's still my program, but he owns the space, if that right. makes sense. Mm. So and you're, that's, and you're that's using, and, and it's under his name. It's the, the building, the, the facility, it's all under his name, which kind of makes sense. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, under his uh, umbrella more or less. Exactly. Exactly. So even though he is not a karate person himself, but he owns the, the, the facility. So, Greg, how about you? How did you go about finding your space for, for where you're going to be teaching? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, well, the space that I, I ended up I'm, I'm using now uh, that is a space that you uh, actually uh, turned me on to, uh, which is a great space. It's, it's a nice old hardwood floor. Uh, I think, what, 30, 40 people could be training in there if we really wanted to. Um, it'd, be, it'd be tight but doable. Yeah, but sir, but it's definitely uh, a, a big enough space to grow in, and uh, that's at a, at a local church in uh, in, in Peterborough. And uh, I have been looking around for a, a spot. I, I checked out the rec center. I checked out a few things. Uh, I wasn't going to do a brick and mortar, not from the get go. I mean, if you're if you're starting out, you can go one of, one of two ways, and that's find a place that already has something and try to build from there, or you could go you know, spend a bunch of money and, and start up a brick and mortar and go that route. And, um, which is a lot riskier. Um, and, uh, I think you, you need more than one person to really, to do, to do that. 
Um, and it also depends on what you want to do with your dojo. Do you really want to make this your full-time job, your, your, your career, and you, and you need to get that going right now? Maybe building a brick and mortar and, you know, put, hoisting a flag saying, you know, karate here or, or BJJ here and doing it that way or doing it the route that the three of us seem to be doing it is finding a space that's already existing, you yeah. know, renting that space and and building it out from there. Yeah. And and I would say, like, when I say brick and mortar, I don't mean you build the space and you own the building. I, no, I was thinking no. more you're like you're renting a space that will be yours 24 hours a day as right. opposed to I'm rent, I mean, essentially, Greg and I know, Greg, I know the situation you're in because listeners might not know this, but I'm I'm training under you. So I'm learning karate now from you. You are my teacher. Um, and so I know that space, you rent it per hour. Yeah. And so you have it for that hour or that two hours or whatever, as opposed to one of the things I wanted to look into would have been great, uh, would be if I could find a place in Keene that I could just rent and it'd be my space 24 hours a day. But the reality is that rent is going to be very, very high which is yeah. why I started looking at other alternatives, whether, and I know a lot of schools have done this, whether it's at a local Elks Lodge or the Eagles Club or VFW or whatever, um, and just rent a space for an hour or two or whatever, and you pay that way. So I, I get that. Um, Nick, how did you go about yours? You worked at the gym that you're teaching at? I have. I've been working at the gym for about eight years, and, the uh, agreement with the owner was always we, you know, when you when you get people, whether you have one or whether you have a thousand, whatever it is, it's just 30 percent of any income coming in. Flat oh, out, nice. yeah, flat out. And um, the uh, the protection also is uh, one of the hurdles I ran into was um, I don't want to jump into this one, but it was like the insurance alone mm -hmm. was a really big deal because I'm independent contract under body, natural fitness in Bar Barrington, Rhode Island. But if I solely teach martial arts, um, and you know, solely oh, do I said Barrington, it all went downhill. Oh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> so at Bar you know, it's uh, Barrington, Rhode Island, um, where I teach there, I'm solely under, uh, you know, under them doing the independent contract thing. So if I teach personal train and teach, which is like 90% martial arts, 10% personal training, my insurance is only $230 a year. If I do 100% martial arts, the insurance is $800 a month. So, yeah. So a conceivable difference that would have to be like holding one or two students at a time, which I obviously don't want to do, but holding one or two students at a point or, you know, as it bobs and flows with the way of school and everything else, um, you know, as you guys know, that does happen. You know, I could still hold the profit there easily versus, you know, okay, I have to hold a dozen to two dozen students to even, even tread water, you know, which we all, you know, we only have so much yeah. time in a day too. You know, so like that, that's, that was one of the biggest hurdles immediately. Once I said, I'm going to do this and I said, well, why don't we try this? But luckily we got a good insurance guy helping us out. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And for me, uh, if I'm going to be teaching at this other location where he's already teaching martial arts, martial arts, he already has the insurance. Yeah. So I'm coming in and not having to worry about that because I will, yes. in all, for all intents and purposes, be an employee of his working for him. So, yeah, Fantastic. Greg, is that something you've had to deal with? Uh, you kind of cut out there from my side. Uh, what would I have to deal with? So, like insurance wise, because if I'm going to be teaching at this other person's school, right. I'm an employee of his. I don't have to worry about that. Have you uh, looked into that? Like, is that an issue that you've had to deal with in in New Hampshire? So that is where I'm – that's the, the stage I'm at right now is I'm, I'm looking at what, what do I need to do to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I'm protected, my, my business is protected, and my students are protected. And um, 
uh, you know, obviously starting an LLC, uh, you know, limited liability company, uh, so to protect yourself from, you know, your, your personal investments. Uh, but th that is a question I have is, you know, do I need to have, um, uh, you know, uh, insurance? I know that, uh, like the AAU provides insurance for, uh, uh, oh, he's nodding over there, uh, for, you know, uh, sports academies. So there's that option. Um, so I'm actually here to learn about this. So, you know, anything you guys can uh, <laughs> yeah, let I, me know, uh, that one. would be great. Yeah, I can jump in on that with so many things. I've been teaching, um, when I first started teaching it on my own, it was 2004. And I had a instance with a student and I, it ended up going to court. I ended up winning the whole thing um, by the grace of God. I ended up winning it all. Um, but the lawyer was saying, like, you need to get insurance. And uh, it's something that I don't want to drudge up right now. Um, but it was it was a very easy misunderstanding in the long run. Um, but for anyone with the way everything is now, especially with the way social media is, um, and, and if anybody come out, I would say definitely to have that it's an investment in case something happens or in case somebody does say something or whatever may happen, not to be doom and gloom, but it is good to have that safeguard with you. Oh, that's interesting. One of the other things I was thinking about too is just from a business standpoint, um, obviously if you have an LLC, um, there's, that, uh, there's that gap between you and your personal. But what you can also do is you can actually set up a trust to own the LLC and make yourself or whoever your partners are as members of that trust. And that puts another layer of division there, uh, at least legally. I mean, that doesn't stop me from needing to get, you know, some sort of uh, liability insurance uh, as well. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but just something I was thinking about. And I, I don't know if you guys have heard of that before at all. Uh, I have. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have much insight on that. But Nick, if you yeah. do, by all means. I, I do. I mean, it's still like a um, you, most people would sign, you know, as a new a new um, student contract. I mean, would have a liability waiver. Um, but a lot of people would say, I mean, it started in the personal training world. There were somebody's doing that and they're signing it and they go ahead. But, well, what happened? Well, I didn't read the whole thing. And if a lawyer looks at it and goes, yeah, that could be misconstrued or, you know, it's, the language isn't quite right. You know, it, it could then fall and it could be the, the liability waiver is null and void, you know, where you could do that. I It does it, it does really become beneficial to at least spend some time, sit with a lawyer and review your student contracts just to say, like, on the outside, is anything, you know, is anything there, air, you know, not airtight? You know, what, what am I missing? And um, when I was teaching originally, um, there was a student who he injured himself and um, he did it and he was fine in the long run. Um, but his parents went under, you know, extreme financial hardship immediately and decided that they wanted to try to sue. And but the, I showed the liability waiver, but the reason being that it didn't go much further than that was because I was teaching out of their house. So when I would said that, they're like, well, no, you brought this person in, you brought them in. So it's assumed liability. Now, around here, I don't know about nationally or anywhere else, but those liability laws and the, those assumed protections have been done away with. So at least yeah, if, you, if, you, if you have that liability behind you, you know, it doesn't go further like anything like with car insurance. You know, if you if you get into an accident, you know, hey, this is my fault. You know, you have collision and liability or whatever it is. And you know, I'm not an expert on that, but at least it doesn't go past that. You got the insurance up to a certain point. You know, my insurance yeah, and I think for a while. For, and I think for the audience, I think it's important to understand yeah. that your state may very well be different. It, the exactly. laws that you need, like neither yeah. of us are lawyers. So yeah. I highly encourage you, look, if this is something you're going to start doing for yourself, yeah. look into it and know what you're getting into ahead of time. 
don't like we're not experts on this yeah. <laughs> uh so don't, please 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 don't don't yeah uh, take well, everything we say as, uh, as gospel just to, yeah just to repeat what i said too it would be beneficial to sit with a lawyer and just say look here is everything i wrote up where do i need to go yeah. like you know there was a guy that i knew from college who he's just like yeah he's like i need some practice with this so he didn't charge me an arm and a leg but, you know, it was just, it was enough to be able to say, okay, good. Now I feel good about going forward. Yeah. yeah. All right. Moving yeah. on to the next thing, the next topic that I was thinking of talking about is students. Like, how are you, like, we're all starting out brand new. Where are we going to, like, what are our plans to get students and uh, getting them in the door? Because without those students, I'm just a crazy person talking to four walls, you know? Right. So, uh, Greg, well, well, I'll throw it over to you, Greg. What are what are you either planning to do or what are you doing to try and get students? Uh, so I haven't started promoting yet. Um, I have a couple of camps that I'm going to be doing, so I wanted to make sure I got through those camps. That's just in the next couple of weeks. And after that, I was going to start with word of mouth. So I, I know a lot of people in the town. Uh, who know a lot of people. So I don't know a lot of people, but I know people who know people. <laughs> so I was going to have them, you know, reach out to their little communities and see if I can get a few students from there and hopefully build a, like a little grassroots. Hey, you know, there's a, a cool little karate place down here. Uh, you should try it out. Um, you know, if that doesn't work uh, or I'm not seeing the results I want, then I'll, I'll think about more traditional methods of promoting uh, marketing. Uh, from, from my standpoint, I'm not building this dojo at the at the moment to be my primary business this is a, a, a you know a, a something i'm going to do because i love it and something i want to you know uh start small and and grow um at a reasonable rate what I, whatever that reasonable rate is uh i'll have to figure out yet but um so starting grassroots first is what i want to do um that may not be what other people need to do um sure. i don't know what, sure. what what's what's nick doing what are you doing my my thing is similar to you, Greg, with word of mouth. Um, right now, one of my students in the town that I uh, the town that the gym is in, his mother is the town nurse. So I've been begging her, and I specialize a lot in teaching people with disabilities. And I said, hey, "Can you please do this? Like printing up things down at the local staples." I said, "If you don't mind, if you hear something." Can you please do it? And she's like, yeah, sure, no problem. Let's go. Like, let's do it. That's great. And, you know, she's like, clearly, you know, and then the other person who I'm teaching as well, his mom is, I think, a secretary at the police station. So, you know, I said, if somebody gets arrested, if you don't mind, send I'm kidding. But, um, you know, but <laughs> by the way, you had, yeah, as part of your recidivist program, why don't you try to join Tabor Fitness Academy? Um, but I kid, I kid. But um, also with that, I've been working with a friend of mine who I hired him to for the next six months for 20% of incoming income to help me out on social media. And he understands that with TikTok, Instagram and Facebook, you know, how to be able to send that out there. So I'm like, OK, good. You, you know, if you can help me out, that would be awesome. And let's see how far we can go. Um, the third factor that I want to do is in the town of Barrington, Rhode Island, I'm planning on going to as many town meetings as I possibly can and just let people know I'm there face to face and see if they have any questions. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good point. You can always reach out to you know your local uh, town and they have like, you yeah. know, they'll put you in touch with like, you know, the, 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 the business administrations and things like that to make sure that you're part of that. And uh, that's a good way to network. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Keen has a, a great young business, uh, a business, what is it? It's the Hannah Grimes Center for Business Entrepreneurship or something, something, something downtown. But it's, you know, or even just going to the Chamber of Commerce and getting connected yeah. with who's in your town um, yeah. is great. For, for me, uh, you know, I've been, anyone that's met me, knows that I'm a very social person. Never noticed. <laughs> yeah, that's a surprise. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? 
so I make friends really easily. And so, you know, I've been living in Keene now for, you know, coming up on seven years. And so my wife and I have made a lot of friends in town. And so, you know, starting out, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm not going to get like a quote unquote prime time teaching spot until this expansion happens at the school, which is not going to be for a few months. And if I sat on my butt from now until then, and then I get a prime time teaching spot, I have no students. Right. And so I realized, you know, pretty early on, you know, when I sat down and had a meeting with him and I said, all right, well, I need to start working now on getting students so that, so that when we open the expansion or when he opens the expansion, I will already hopefully have some students. So what he agreed to do is let me use his facility right now, anytime that there's not class happening. And so what I've done is I, just like you, Greg, I'm going word of mouth. I posted on Facebook and I thought long and hard about what I was going to post about, you know, I'm now going to be teaching karate in Keene, New Hampshire. Uh, and I, at first I started typing out, uh, you know, I, I went and I picked out t three time sec three times throughout the week that I'm going to be teaching class. One of those times is, is one particular morning day from like eight to nine in the morning. One day is from three to four in the afternoon. And one, there is one evening class I'm able to get at seven 15. So at first I list, I was going to list the days that I'm going to be teaching these classes. But then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to say that I've got classes available morning, afternoon, and evening. And you've got to contact me for info, for details, because I don't want that passive engagement. I don't want someone to just read everything and get all the answers they want. And then, yeah, maybe they're, right. they're looking for a reason not to go. Right. Oh, it doesn't work for me. I'm going to leave. Instead, oh, if I... someone reads that and is interested, oh, well, you know what? I mean, I might be interested. I wonder when his, I have a morning free. I wonder when his morning classes are. And so then they're going to message me, which gets them directly in touch with me. So now I have a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And I can well, the tell them, oh, is you know, are you interested? Like class is going to be, mornings is going to be this day. But I get that one-on-one -on -one interaction. I get their name. I know how to contact them. And it's not passive engagement. I'm getting very active engagement because of that. Or I would say I'm getting, I haven't gotten a lot yet because I only posted it like three days ago as of this recording. Um, in fact, funny story. The only actual engagement I got was one woman, woman posted, all she commented on the Facebook post was where question mark. Cause I didn't put where classes are going to be happening either. Because again, I want that, that active engagement. So now right away, I should have just not done anything because I put very clearly in the post, if you're interested, please send me a private message. Well, she didn't even follow the directions, but I figured, okay, this is my first person. I'm all excited. All right. So I message her and I said, Hey, person's name. Uh, this is Andrew. I just posted about teaching karate and key. And I understand you might be interested. And her first message back within 15 seconds was, I was, but I asked you a very direct question and you seem like a scammer and she blocked me. Ooh. I, that is a concern, I guess, nowadays is, is yeah. worrying about being concerned. I mean, every time I get a phone call, I, I, I automatically think it's a scam to begin with. So, yeah. So right. fortunately, uh, my wife went on the post and commented like, Andrew is, you know, great teacher. And a couple other of my, actually my drum students who know me are in that group as well and said, oh, Andrew's a great person, like blah, 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 blah. And so it, you know, it, I don't think anyone will have that, that uh, issue now, but it was just kind of a funny little story. Like, oh, she thought I was a scammer just because I didn't immediately give her what she was looking for. So right. anyway, so, I mean, that's what I'm doing to, to try and get students and, you know, hopefully – I can build up, get a few students here or there so that when the expansion happens, they'll be able to just move into a regular, you know, regular evening time slot. And then growing, going forward, 
Um, you know, my I don't anticipate this is going to be my full time gig. You know, I'm not going to be teaching martial arts full time. At least I don't envision that happening. Um, but you know, it is going to be a, you know, a little bit of uh, income coming in. Um, but I want the school to continue to grow and do well. Um, have any of you guys thought about maybe a year down the road, depending on how things go? You know, there are lots of programs that martial arts schools can get into to quote grow your numbers fast or whatever. Have you <laughs> thought about or looked into any of those things? If if you want to grow your numbers, you got to teach kids. Right. Uh, I mean, that's where you know if you want to, especially if you want to have a that be your full time job. Uh, kids, it, kids are that's your that's your source of income. Um, and if you're going to teach kids, uh, I think a great way to do that is to, uh, go to your, your local schools and see if there's a program that you can offer for free and, you know, use that as a, you know, Hey, if you like this, you know, I do teach karate and here is where it is and do that a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, that's definitely a, a way to, you know, get students and, uh, and get engagement with the local community as well. Yeah. I'm on a yeah, similar yourself. Yeah, I'm on a similar boat with that. Actually, I'm um, I'm working with just ways that I could, you know, t- teach some programs and teach something, and also getting on TikTok, getting on any you know, social media. At least know that I'm a genuine person. You know, I have the scammer thing as well. You know that I get to like, you know, you teach karate, really? Yes, I do. You know, yes, um, and. Uh, just trying to do that and then just say, hey, here's something at least we can do on a, uh, like, if for free or on a donation basis. You know, something, you know, and I, I've always had with my past teachers, they always said, you know, something is better than nothing. You know, if you have one student right now, you could teach and get a little money. That's better than just sitting there and waiting for them to come in. So let's you know, do as much as you can. And I had a friend of mine who... All of us know um, who there who taught me that said if you if you want to teach however however many hours you want to teach if you teach four or five hours a week you should be spending the rest of the time promoting and letting people know you're there you know and doing what we do and there's also you know my own podcast that I do as well to try to keep that going so hopefully there's many different avenues of marketing that I'm working on. Yeah, I think the important thing to recognize is that there there are multiple ways of doing this, right? The marketing, whether it's word of mouth. Well, that right. word of mouth can be you talk to your wife and your wife talks to all of her friends and you talk to your friends. Then there's social media, word of mouth. Um, you know, there are uh, – and, and then even in social media, there's lots of different ways to go in it, right? going to schools, going around, talking to people there, all of that stuff. None of this is the right answer. They're all different ways. Um, There are, you know, martial arts programs out there to help promote you. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Whistlekick Alliance. Um, That's one of the things that Whistlekick has really worked really hard on doing is creating a program to help martial arts school owners not just be able to promote their school, but to give them tools that they can use as their, their school grows. And so I definitely wanted to throw that out there. Is there anything that you guys envision, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we're, I, I'm thinking of wrapping up here a little bit, but I, w- I want to make sure that if there's anything that we've missed, anything that you envision stumbling blocks you've had getting to where you are now with the school or anything like that, like mine I, was the, I'm a scammer, obviously, yeah. uh, but Nick, what about you? Anything, come up any trials and tribulations like yeah. funny little anecdotes that may have happened i think what always happens is you know you're constantly having to market yourself and that could be you know a little exhausting so you want to keep the students as much as you possibly can and um you run into like one of the phrases i like to call the blue belt blues which is not 100 percent me that's more kelly thomas um where people go further enough and then they get disinterested and move on um, but you do, um, you do just try to get them and do the best possible. And I think, um, I would say a last bit of advice is to try to, um, <clears throat> try to, um, you know, do as much as you can to be open to the community 
and um, you know, realize that your responsibility is not just from when class begins to when class ends. The responsibility is to be there as much as you possibly can for any student. You know, through the years, every student has had my personal cell phone number, and I said, if you need me, call me anytime. And you know, my original sensei has always done, did the same thing and said, here we go. You know, someday I might need you. You know, I might need you to do that. So at least it's a big open process. You know, that's my spiel. Greg, anything anything from you that you can think of? Uh, no, not yet. I'm sure it's going to happen soon. Obviously, I'm I'm right at the cusp of uh, this. This is all starting now. Um, I think, you know, I, the hardest part so far has been just setting up a, you know, a company. Oh, you know what? There was the big stumbling block. You know what this stumbling block was? Finding a name. You know, I, I thought, ah, oh, it's going to be easy to find a name. And uh, every time I came up with a good one, there was another karate studio, studio out there that had it. Or there was another, you know, similar uh, name somewhere. And I've always been the kind of person that I don't want it to be my name on it. I don't want it to be, uh, you know, you know, Greg Williams, you know, does your, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, uh, obviously, you know, people do that all the time. I have good friends with their name on it, but I, I wanted it to have, I don't know, maybe a, a life of its own, even if I'm not the instructor someday, maybe I pass it on and, you know, I wanted it to be its own right. thing. Um, and it was a stumbling box finding the name. So um, that was that was my biggest hurdle thus far. I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty more to come, but you know. All right. So before we wrap up, let's Greg. I'll, I'll have you finish up uh, here. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, do you want to say the name of your school? Did you come up with a good one? Uh, but how can we? <laughs> if people are interested, tell us a little bit about like where you are. You know sure. what what your what your what your offering. Uh, and how people can get in touch with you. Sure. Uh, the name of the school is Mountain Forest Karate. Um, I live in the White Mountains. I study small forest karate. Kind of made sense. Uh, you, you can reach me at uh, Mountain Forest Karate at iCloud.com. Uh, and uh, I'm teaching traditional martial arts in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Awesome. Nick? You can reach me. You can go on the website, TaborFitness.com, T-A-B-E-R Fitness.com. My contact information is there as well as any social media possible. Awesome. And uh, where is your school located? Barrington, Rhode Island, and also any place in multiple places in Fall River, Massachusetts. Awesome. And I'm teaching in Keene, New Hampshire, uh, I, I don't have a name for what I'm doing, but I'm teaching my classes at Elements MMA. Um, uh, most listeners know how to get in touch with me. I'm Andrew at whistlekick.com. Uh, and right now, like I said, teaching a, a morning class, an afternoon class, and one evening class. And then in the once the expansion happens in a few months, uh, hopefully I'll be getting on like a two night a week regular sort of rotation anything else guys before we wrap up no no i'm seeing nothing all right so uh, <laughs> yeah, nothing to the audience thank you so much for joining us uh keep keep tabs on what these guys are doing i think i think you're going to see some good things coming from these guys and from their schools i'm really excited to see uh how they they both grow uh i know both of them will be presenting at uh, Marshall Summit this year uh, in Keene, New Hampshire. So uh, you can always, if you're interested in chatting with them, you can do it directly. Um, if you're interested in information on Marshall Summit, you can go to marshallsummit.com. Um, whistlekick.com is where you can go to find all of our stuff, whether you want to buy a cool Whistlekick t-shirt like this, uh, or maybe a hat or a hoodie. Um training programs we have a, a great program on how to on stretching which by the way the stretching program is completely free that's right it costs zero dollars you can go whistlekick.com put it in your cart for nothing and it will just be emailed to you and it's a great training program um 
sparring gear, all kinds of stuff. And uh, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where you can go to find out all the information on some of the stuff we talked about. All of the these guys' contact information will be listed there as well. So, guys, thanks so much for joining me, and uh, I look forward to seeing you both soon. Uh, some of you sooner than others, for sure. Uh, and until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, sir. Yeah.